anticipated literary event of 2020. Some say an online event that I was invited to by a friend or that you scrolled and found on Instagram. And some say an event about writing or publishing or something, or some say I'm just here. But we would like to call this Publish Me, the, writing, the business of writing. And what we are here today to do, oh, sorry, I am Tony, Tony Langhorn, and I am the owner of 2i Publishing as well as Poetics University. And we will be discussing and allowing you all to ask us about the business of writing. And we have a, a group of panelists here that are all professional and, and experienced in their fields. And we are here to answer those questions that always is in the back of our mind as writers, as well as editors. And that is, how do you do it? How to improve? Or what are the other options that I have in the industry? And no matter where you are, whether you're a beginner or whether you're just writing your diary right now and you're like, I may want to write a book one day. Or if you're an editor that has, a, that has maybe one or two years of experience and you want to see what's the next level. Or you may be someone that is actually already prepared with a book ready and you want to know your options. So we have a panelist here from all different backgrounds, all different, um, all different areas of expertise. And we are here to actually welcome you and bring you into the world of writing and learning the business thereof. So I'm gonna turn it over to Dara, who will be giving us the remarks. Begin. I just wanna say welcome and thank you as well. So this event was a brainchild of myself some time ago and it didn't have any way to make it happen. And so I partnered with Tony um, as part, I'm also his VP at, um, at Poetics University. So we work very closely, quite frequently. Um, and so we were talking and having a discussion about the difference between being self-published and being a small business. I'm a small printing house. And that came into a whole like, you know what, we should just have, the, we, should, we should hash this out in front of a bunch of people, um, which is not what we're gonna do. But it was just the idea of like, this is a bigger conversation. I know I get approached quite frequently. I know he gets approached quite frequently and it made sense to be able to bring all of our networks together to have this event. I am also a member of the New York Urban League Young Professionals. So I'm super excited to have them be part of this, um, this event as well. And I think we made a great team to bring a whole bunch of people with a whole bunch of different experiences to the table to one, have this conversation, but also to um, make space because I think what I have said in the last few weeks is that I cannot correct what's going on outside in the world. I can't fix it. I don't know how to fix and change all the bad things that are happening. But what I can do is help other writers not be silenced. I can help people who don't have those platforms to learn how to have that platform. So this is why this event is very important to me. So I'm very grateful to all of you to have joined. And again, I'm thankful to, um, to I Publishing and Poetic Shoe and New York Urban League um, Young Professionals and welcome. Eunice. And good evening, everyone. My name is Eunice McCoy, and I serve as the president of the New York Urban Young Professionals. Um, the New York Urban Young Professionals is a young professionals group with members aged 21 to 40 in the New York City area who supports our local affiliate, which is the New York Urban League. The New York Urban League is a part of the National Urban League, which is one of the largest and oldest civil rights organizations in the United States. And when we Dara has been a member of our organization for over a decade, and she has served in different executive um, capacities, um, community service chair, and other roles. So when she came to us uh, with this event, we definitely loved to hop on and be a part of it. And so we're a co-sponsor with this event, and we're so thankful to have everyone here today, and I'm thankful to be able to serve as the moderator today. So without further ado, I forgot. Um, Sorry, because I, I always forget what the things that I represent. So I'm here as a representative of the Black Authors Collaborative, which I founded four years ago um, in conversation with other authors trying to pull resources and figure out how to build a network in which we don't necessarily always have. So that when I say that this tonight has been a big part of what I've been trying to do for a while, it is 
the, the idea and concept behind the Black Authors Collaborative, which is collaborating with our resources so that our voice becomes louder and more public. Sorry. That is okay. So again, we just wanted to welcome everyone here. We thank you for being here. Um, and we're actually going to hop into the panel right now. So I'm going to read our wonderful panelist bio so you can know a little bit more about who is in the room today. So I'm going to start off with Mr. Tony Leghorn. So Tony is an author, visual artist, and owner of I Publishing, Two I Publishing, a unique small business publisher that specializes in poetry. Tony utilizes his passion for both people and poetry with his visual arts background to help authors create literary experiences. His unique approach to publishing centers around the reader's experience and has led to new techniques, layouts, and styles that have readers captivated from cover to content. He is dedicated to giving words life and connecting readers with authors around the world. Our next panelist is Dara Kalima. Dara is an author and poet, poet from the Bronx whose journey is writing has been an adventure since the age of nine. From stages in her community to her international debut in Scotland in 2018, Dara's words have touched the lives of many. She has authored three self-published titles, founded Black Authors Collaborative, and is now the Vice President of Poetics University, an international institute for poets. Kamala's experience, education, and passion for writing has led her to become a growing leader in the writing community. Then we have Dominique Lambright. Dominique Lambright is a rising editor who fell in love with words as a child. Since then, she has become an author of five titles, a graduate from U. W. Milwaukee with a BA in English and has built her editorial services from side hustle to established business. With over five years of experience, Dominique treats every project equally, despite their differences in content and budget. She makes sure that every project receives the same hard work, high determination and initiative and dedication that she is known for. Then we have Jim McCarthy. Jim is a vice president and literary agent at Destel, Goldrich and Borat, where he started his publishing career over two decades ago. His list focuses on fiction for all ages, ranges, as well as narrative, nonfiction, and memoir. It includes New York Times bestselling with Shell Mead, Morgan Rhodes, Victoria Laurie, Robin Talley, along with critical, celebrated, and award-winning authors such as Joy McCauley, Fonda Lee, Remy La, and many more. And then we have George Soros. George is the author of international best-selling young adult science fiction novel, Exit. Exitler and its two sequels, and the five part science fiction sports serial from Parts Unknown. He served as president of the Missouri Writers Guild from 2017 to 2018, and is the host and producer of the podcast Exitler Journeys and From Duck Till Dark outside the Marvel Studios. He is also an audiobook narrator, lending his voice to books of all genres. As a New Yorker since birth, George now lives in St. Louis, Missouri with his wife and kids. And that is who is all serving on our panel today. So before we hop in to asking our panelists questions, we actually had a couple of poll questions for you in the audience. Our first question is, we wanna know who is here in the room with us? Is anyone a published author? So the poll should have just launched and you would have a couple of seconds to pull it out. Okay. Okay. So, seventy-one percent of you guys in the room are not actually published authors, but thirty percent is. Twenty-nine percent is a published author, which is great. So. Uh, everyone on the call, you'll be able to learn more and actually to get yourself into being a published author. Now, if you are a writer in the room, how long have you been writing? Okay, so we do have 
a lot of people in the room who have been writers for a while. So 2.5 years, and I've been in this writing game for a minute, is the most people in the room. About 92% of you guys have been writing for a while, and 8% has just picked up. We'll have something for all you guys. So thank you all for coming to this panel discussion. And we're going to just jump in right now to our questions. And we're going to kick it off with asking everyone on the panel, from your perspective, what is the process from getting from words on paper to publishing and going to print? How does the business of writing work? And anyone on the panel can just jump in right now for this question. So I guess I'll go first as like a self-published person. Um, the process of going from paper to print, uh, it's just, so for me, I fell into it. I did a self-help class and the question is, what do you want? And somehow the answer became, I wanna write a book. So I spoke to one of my friends, um, who's Stanley Fritz, who's an author and advocate um, out in these streets. And he um, sat down and walked me through the process and I didn't know what I could do. I just knew I had poems and I knew that it was easier than I thought it would be. And so I just leaked. Um, so it's just a matter of like believing that you have enough um, because somebody needs to hear your words. So it's just, it's just when it's, I, for me, it's just when you kind of decide that it's time, that it's, um, that you just need to leap. And that appears usually. Uh, I'll go next. Um, for me, it, it was very exciting. Uh, when I first started writing, I didn't know where it would go. Um, when I did decide that I wanted to be a professional author, uh, once I got my content together, uh, organizing it, figuring out um, how I wanted it to be portrayed to the audience that I was going for, um, having the creative freedom, you know, finding a cover designer or, you know, on Amazon, they have the ones that you can create. Uh, I don't know, the whole thing was exciting and um, I started out self-publishing. So that was definitely a process to learn and get used to. And um, I like knowing that I'm able to help other people go through it now. Uh, as far as uh, that goes. So it, it's exciting to me. Uh, for me, it's been a matter of making sure that you have a story to tell. Um, when I was when I was a kid, my friends and I would put together our own characters that were based on all the different things we were watching uh, when I was growing up in the 80s. And it was it was a lot of fun putting those characters together, but there really was no real thrust. There really was no real story connected with them until a couple of years later. And it was that time, that's when I really started, instead of just like just drawing the characters, I would start filling up my notebooks with those stories, with the stories about them, with their story of getting them getting together. In the ninth grade, I went ahead and filled up like about like 200 uh, loose leaf pages to tell like this, you know, quote unquote definitive story of these of these characters. And, um, and then, Obviously, as time passed, you know, like I just, I just held on to those characters because I knew that once the right story was going to be there, once it was going to come together, then I knew that's when it was time to put it down and be serious about it. And um, with, uh, you know, like I started out with self-publishing and then um, with my, uh, with both my book from Parts Unknown and then in 2010 with Excelsior. And um in 2013, I wound up, uh, you know, taking a, sh taking a chance with a small press publisher. And they basically asked me, it was just like, um, you know, this sounds, real, this sounds really good. Uh, we're very interested, but I see that you've self-published. You know, it looks like you've had some success with that. Are you okay with that? And I said, yeah, I wanted to, you know, just really, I felt like I kind of hit the ceiling. So it was a matter of just like those sort of instincts that you have as you go along when you know like what direction you want to take your stories. Um, so with that, it's for me, it's just like, just make sure you have that story down and make sure you know which direction you want to go with it. Are you committed to going the self-publishing route? Do you want to give it, give a shot to, uh, do you want to get, take a shot and send it out to a literary agent to maybe get the ball rolling on that end? Do you also want to work with, self, with small press publishers? You have those options and 
these days, the, the opportunities are just limitless. Great, I'll, I'll go next. Um, sorry, Jim, got there first. <laughs> um, so the two questions that you ask are two different things um, to me. The process of going from, you know, words to, on, on paper to publishing and going to print is one thing. And that is usually a um, in, intrinsic type of journey. It's something that, you know, you write these words and then an idea of actually having a book comes to mind. And so you can actually go through the, you know, the self-publishing route to actually satisfy that intrinsic um, journey. Or if you actually start thinking or if you start, it's, it's when you start sharing your work and you hear people are like, they're interested or they, they like it. And, and, and they, they tell you that, oh, you should write a book or, and these things start to happen. That's when the business comes in. And that's when you start to understand that you are a, a brand. So you're not only just a writer that has words on a piece of paper, but you have something that people are intrigued by or people can learn from or the experience can help a person go from one point to another. And that is the, that is the, the business side. So when I first, I, did, I was an author first before I was actually a publisher and, and I basically I was doing an open mic. And so I would read my poetry and some poems, people would come up to me after the show and say your words like did this and that and so then life kind of just happened and so I just started working on this book and I put the book out and people were like oh this is this is great that's great and then I learned that there was a lot of people that had the same kind of effect on people with their words but they go they go on because publishing is something that is so unknown you know, you know you know you can make a book on different ways but how to do it is really not taught it's there's really no handbook on it and and either and then going to a big publisher is a big unknown and so i started a, the the smaller press to kind of fill in that gap to help people understand what their book is far as the business side, but then also to help them get to uh, uh, the, the, the part that they're, the intrinsic part, which is put their words out to, to, to have a book. So, um, and, and for people to actually be affected by that. So, yeah, so that's the two part question. And I'll jump in just um, as someone who has always worked in the traditional publishing space, I think, uh, it, as has been mentioned, the first step is have a book. Um, is you know once you've written something that that can be called a book that 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 feels complete, you've already done I think the hardest part of the work, and you should congratulate yourself for that. And then uh, you should start to research, which you're obviously already doing if you're taking part in this panel. Um, and and figure out uh, the differences between self-publishing and traditional publishing. Uh, what works for you, what's most important to you. Um, and I'm excited, I think, that uh, we'll have the chance to really uh, explore that in greater depth, um, given the, the diversity of backgrounds of, of the panelists, um, and, and can get into some of the nitty gritty of, of what the differences are, what the, what the downsides to traditional publishing are, what the upsides to self-publishing are, um, and, and sort of further explore. But yeah, the first step is, is having a book. Uh, and I, I congratulate anyone who has ever achieved that. Thank you all. So George, you touched on this and I think all of you guys actually touched on this, knowing that you have a story to tell when you are mm -hmm. starting your writing, when you have the words, what is your story? But as a writer, how do you know when it's time to stop just writing for yourself but to share the work with the world and seek out being published or publishing opportunities? Um, it's, there's definitely some instincts that, that go with it because um, the main thing that you need to make sure you're doing is you need to make sure that you are not doing everything yourself um, because you cannot afford all the plane tickets to go to all the different readers so that you can look over their shoulder and say, what I really meant to say was this. Uh, you don't want to do that. So you need to have a team on hand. You need to have some sort of an editor. Uh, you need to have some sort of beta readers. 
um, because what they'll do is they will go ahead and read what you have and they will point out, you know, like what works, what doesn't work and what's, what's unclear. You know, they, they're, you know, they're absolutely essential. Um, when I wrote the first draft of Excelsior back in 2008, I was so convinced that all I needed to do was just kind of brush up a few little things here and there, and then it was ready to go out into the world of the literary agents to query, because I knew that I had something that could work universally. And when I showed it to one of my friends who is a, was a longtime editor, she took a look at that first chapter and then got back to me and said, this is going to take a lot of work. And we worked for almost two years together, um, just constantly reshaping and, you know, mo moving different things around. And um, as things were going, it felt like my, my writing was getting stronger. I felt like I was getting more confident in everything. And, um, and then finally, after almost two years, we sat down, we read the whole thing out loud. And all of a sudden we found all these other spots that were missed. And so it was a matter of going back and, you know, cleaning those up. But uh, once we got those all taken care of, then the two of us were able to look at each other and just say, okay, it's ready. Um, so I would definitely say, you know, like they always say writing is rewriting. That is 100% the key because you cannot rewrite from nothing. You have to have some form of a foundation out there and you have to constantly work at it because it's not going to be gold coming out the very, um, right at the, at the very beginning. We all want it to be but it's not going to be. So I would say in terms of, you know, like knowing that it's done, if you're able to go through it and be like really happy with it and you're able to, you know, like get excited about what's, what people are about to read and any sort of mistakes that you find, you're able to go ahead and address and take care of and any sort of plot threads that you may have missed, you know, you're, it's, it's all about just making sure that when you go from start to finish, you're satisfied. And once you're satisfied and once, you know, like your readers, the beta readers, your editor, once they are satisfied, it's good to go. Does anyone have anything to add to that? Oh, anyone else? Okay. Um, I, I was just going to say um, it's, it's a feeling that you, that you get, you know, I don't, to go from, go from writing from yourself to writing to the world. It's, it's also being it out in, well, what about Yuri? I think that's, <laughs> um, I think it's, it's, it's when some, when you're in an environment and you're sharing your words and, you know, enough people are telling you or enough people are asking you or are saying that your words are, 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 are nice or, you know, they're, they're this, they're that, you know, and then I, I, be, I believe what, what George said is, is correct. Like you can't do it alone. So you, you have those initial people that say, oh, your, your words are, are, are great. You can tweak this, tweak that. And, I, and I'm coming from the poetry background. So um, <laughs> long novels or anything like that is not my <laughs> expertise. But when it comes to poetry, you do have a little bit more kind of freedom in your own style. Mm -hmm. um, Th that you know you can't do too much editing but there is some editing that is involved but um have an editor looks look at it have someone read it if you're working with an agent you know they're gonna look at it and, and let you know if it's viable or not <laughs> but um so so those those are the it, it's it's all about the other people that are around you to me that's when you should don't force it <laughs> okay so we're going to actually hop into finding out what is a literary agent, what is the editor, what is the publisher. So people in the audience, we have another poll question for you to see if you are aware of actually what goes into each of these roles. So I'm going to start with the literary agent. So the poll question just launched. What do you guys think is a literary agent? Okay. 
think most of the people are actually getting it correct, which is great. <laughs> it's the longest description. That's that's, that's, the, mul that's the multiple yeah. choice secret right there. That's I like, think all right. That's like, like it's too much stuff. Of course, that has to be it, right? <laughs> That, that's yeah, the secret to getting a high minute. score in your SAT. <laughs> so, so the definition of literary agent that we got courtesy of Google is a person whose job it is to find publishers for writers they represent. They negotiate contracts on, on the writer's behalf and can manage and plan a writer's career. So I'm actually going to go to you, Jim, now for your question. So Jim, from reading um, your long bio, I don't think we actually had it in the short bio, but you actually made a major career switch after studying city planning in college. So what ignited your passion for the literary world and how do you continue to find the next bestseller as a literary agent after being in here, this game 20 years later? Yeah, I, um, I fell into this. I got really lucky. Um, the summer after my freshman year of college, I needed a part-time job because I had already spent all the money I'd saved for all four years. It was, it was gone. I needed uh, an income and I sent out about 45 resumes and the first place to call me back is the agency I still work with. Um, I started there part-time, um, really only knowing that I love to read, um, but not really knowing what a literary agent was or or what went into the process. Um, so I stumbled in and then I, I found uh, a group of people who uh, I've been working with ever since. It's, a, it's a, an agency where I think more than half of us have been there for 20 years or longer. Uh, so it's a, it's a sort of wonderful, stable group of people. Um, and then in terms of how I find bestsellers, I, I you know, I, I just, I hope I do. I, I, um, I'm always trying to look for, for work that feels special, for voices that feel distinct, um, and for stories I haven't heard before. I think that um, the best, the best of what's out there um, is, is always what feels freshest and what feels newest. Um, so I'm just kind of always trying to do a little better than I did the year before, find books that are um, more challenging, more exciting, um, and, and have broader appeal. So it's, it's looking for that perfect combination of plot and voice and character um, and, and storytelling. Um, and that's on the fiction side. On the nonfiction side, it's a little bit more about who a person is and and how established they are in their their career. Um, on the fiction side, it's it's exciting. To, I, I find it more exciting uh, because it's really all about the the work and the content and just finding things that you're passionate about and believe readers will fall in love with. Uh, and then it is about selling it to a publisher and and hopefully working with each client long term and finding a way to not only get their first book out there, but build a career uh, from that point on so that not only uh, is there work in the world, but that it's, uh, that, it, that publishing becomes a sustainable career, uh, which uh, economically is incredibly challenging, uh, but it, it is my goal that all of my clients are able to support themselves on their writing alone. That's, that's the hope. It's not always the way, the case, um, but, uh, but that's, that's the aim. Um, Jim, I, I would, I'm sorry. I, I just want to um, add, cause we just talked about when, when it, when do people actually go from words on paper to actually publishing? When do they actually decide to go to the liter literary agent? Sure. I would say that you go to a literary agent when the book you've written is the best book you can finish on your own. Um, it's, uh, it's a little hard uh, to, to know that sometimes, and I know a lot of authors have trouble letting go, um, but I think it's not when it's perfect, because no book is ever perfect, and, and I know a lot of writers who would uh, sort of torture themselves over certain word choices for years if if someone didn't pull the project away from them. Um, it's when you feel like 
it is as good as you'll make it on your own. And the changes that you're making are no longer um, incredibly uh, small. Um, if there are no more big changes left to make and you think it's the best that you can do, then you're ready to go out and look for an agent who will then work with you editorially uh, to get it to where they think it's the best it can be um, and then try to sell it to a publisher where another editor will come in and try to make it the best they think it can be. So it's sort of a series of processes of, of other people coming in to try to help you perfect the work. Um, but once, yeah, once you're, once you've done that for yourself, that's when you're ready to look, I think. Okay, yeah, we're actually going to hop over to the editor side right now. So we're going to launch our next follow question and ask everyone, do you guys know the definition of an editor? And it shouldn't be that easy this time because the definitions <laughs> are the same list. <laughs> The hardest part is actually making the false ones. <laughs> it's making the wrong ones. <laughs> I love that first one. <laughs> Fun fact, I wanted to be an English major when I was in college, but there was no such degree in my school. What? Yeah, they only did literature. They didn't do English. And there's a difference fundamentals <laughs> oh, wow my school had like seven different english tracks <laughs> that's, that's why i was like what <laughs> no that's why i ended up well that's not why i ended up in drama studies but drama studies was under the lit track <laughs> i'm gonna turn my screen off for half a second sorry guys okay so most people actually said they believe it's the person who was there to help the writer shape the story and outline the book to a final polished, pol polished product. So we're going to actually go to Dominique. Um, well, Dara, actually, because I forgot which one was our right to finish it. Because it sounds good, right? That one? I thought. Is it? <laughs> but our right definition was Dara. I'm going to tell you the right definition. A person who is in charge of and determines the final content of text, particularly a newspaper or magazine, or now that's a different site. That answers a little bit whatever the printed material is at this point. Yes. Or it's digital. Wow. That is what Google said. But the other definition seems pretty right. So, Dominique, we're actually going to go to you. You've been in the editing business since 2014. So what kind of training and background did you have to obtain to be an editor? Uh, so basically, well, my initial goal going into college was to actually get a creative writing degree. But then after talking to my counselor, he was like, well, maybe you should probably try to go with a degree that you can get a job first. <laughs> so um, I chose to go with the technic English technical slash professional writing track um, at my university. And that basically went through a lot of courses that had to do with the technical aspects such as business writing. Uh, there was a little bit of publishing in there, but uh, that wasn't the main focus because within that publishing uh, course, we talked a lot about editing in the technical sense uh, for newspapers, magazines, um, things of that nature, or textbooks, uh, manuals, uh, uh, what they called uh, contracts, things like that, anything in the technical writing realm. So for me, um, even though I was doing the technical aspect, I still took electives in creative writing and I took a lot of courses having to do with English seminars that analyze different texts and literature. I took uh, courses that had to do with poetry workshops, um, short story workshops, um, just so that I could also be refining my own writing so that I could understand why certain things needed to be in place to have comprehensive um, sentences, uh, structure-wise um, formatting, and then I also, <clears throat> I also had courses that such as grammar usage, punctuation, things like that, because within forming proper sentences, you also need to make sure that they're reading to the audience how you want it to read. So a lot of people, they use examples like commas. Um, if you don't place the comma in the proper 
point in the sentence, it can read completely different than what you initially wanted it to read. So for me, I just took a lot of courses having to do with the technical aspect. And then I also did my own research um, as far as when it came to uh, writing books and stories and things like that within my, um, my electives that I took. Okay. So for writers, Dominique, what is, why is it important to get an editor as a writer? And what does the process look like when you are working with one of your writers that you're editing for? Okay. So it's important to have an editor as a writer because a lot of the times we don't catch what someone else might catch. And that goes for beta readers as well. Um, they catch things or they ask questions um, that maybe you didn't consider as you were writing. Because say if you're writing a fiction, you know, you might tell this elaborate story, create your own world and everything. And because it's all in your head, you know what it looks like exactly, but sometimes the reader may not see what you're seeing. So you have to make sure that um, everything is out there that you want it to get out. And an editor can help with that by asking the certain questions when they go in and look at your plot, um, the character development, uh, making sure things flow properly. You wanna make sure all of that is in place so there's no plot holes, um, places that aren't, in, aren't consistent because sometimes that happens, you know, we might say a character has brown eyes and you know, if it's fiction, they might have blue hair or something, but then later you might say they have red hair and blue, or blue eyes or something like that. So you wanna make sure that you're being consistent and that goes for nonfiction as well. They may not have, you know, the character development aspect of it, but the same applies to when you're telling a story or when you're trying to help someone else uh, get through something that they've been through. If you're trying to tell how you overcame it, again, the story is in your head and you know what happened, maybe going through something traumatic or something that was exciting, but then the reader might ask, well, how else did you feel about this or who else was involved in this? Um, or, you know, what was the outcome? You may forget to add that in there because in your head, you already know what's going on. So you're not adding as much detail. You're not giving the reader the full disclosure that maybe they need to fully understand what you're trying to write. And then an editor, they'll catch all of those things for you and help make sure that the story is to the best of its ability to either help someone or the best of its creative ability. Darla, you seem like you're ready to jump in. <laughs> so no, she said beta reader, and it was so important because beta readers, though not editors at all, they're sort of your first line of defense of, are, am I telling that story correctly? I have had the pleasure, because I know everyone on this panel, of being a beta reader for George. And I was like, for the longest, I was here when his first book dropped. And I was here when the book we released. And, I was, and I'm like, where's the next book? Where's the next story? Where's the next story? And I would harass him every conversation we ever had was where's the next story. And then I was honored to be one of his beta readers. And he wrote this elaborate story. And I just sat there and was like, but what is that? I'm not, it's beautiful, but it's not, it's a lot of information. <laughs> you know. But he's built this beautiful world that he's in love with. And that me as somebody who's not in the same level of love with it, but loves the story. I'm just like, that's, that was, a lot, that was a lot of information. So it gave him the ability to be able to reach work that area, you know? And then the product ends up being tighter because you've now bounced it off of other people. And when mm -hmm. I write my own stuff, I, have, I don't have editors traditionally, at least not for my poetry books, um, but, I, but I don't have beta readers either. I have a team of three people who have read my stuff and they give me all the feedback between the actual edit notes, the concept, the structure of my book. And they meet, like the book, would, none of my books would be what they were if they didn't have that process built into the releasing of it, because it would have been typos galore. There's still a few to get through. Um, <laughs> there, would have been, there would have been typos galore, and it would have been less of an experience. I write my books to be an experience in terms of the order, if you read it in order. But if it wasn't for other people going, no, Dara, that's not the right experience, I would have never known to do it correctly. So those people are clutch when it comes to actually making a product of a book. And I think that goes into the actual process of working uh, with a writer as an editor. For me, the process that I like to go through is a consultation. You know, I like to hear about your story. You know, what's your vision for what you're trying to write? If you're writing nonfiction, what is the message you're trying to portray? And then once I actually go through their book, fiction or nonfiction, 
I can pull out those things that we talked about in the consultation and make sure that they're hitting those points. Or if they feel like they have a weak point, I can make sure that I pay more attention to that. Or if they feel like um, maybe some of their character development is lacking, you know, I can pay more attention to the characters, you know, things like that. And then once we have our consultation, I like to offer a sample edit and that way they can see how I edit, see if it's something that fits with, you know, maybe how they envision, envision the editing process to go, you know, if they're, they're in agreement of like, okay, I like the way you, you edit. I like the way that you broke down certain things, um, et cetera, <clears throat> et cetera. <laughs> and then in that people find who might be the right fit for them as an editor, because there are, there have been a couple clients where, you know, I wasn't, the right fit for them and I'm okay with that because everyone needs to find an editor that relates to their vision or that can work on their project where they feel like it's in good hands because they're going to take it with all the care and consideration that they would if I was writing it or something like that and then uh, there are different levels of editing so we have the heavy edit and that has to do with uh, character development plot, uh, making sure it flows, inconsistencies, and that takes a deeper dive into um, breaking up their uh, story a lot more elaborately, because we're taking a lot more time to make sure that these characters are developed well, that their, their actions and their mannerisms relate to the characterizations that they have maybe in the beginning, middle, and end of the book. If a character is supposed to be this, you know, make sure that's consistent throughout the book. If a character is supposed to have a breakthrough, you know, you got to pick when that happens, you know, if they had the breakthrough and if that was successfully executed. And then, of course, you have the medium level of edits, you know, maybe the person is a great writer or a decent writer at least, and all you have to look at is making sure that some things are consistent, uh, making sure that it flows, and then light editing, of, of course, is like the grammatical portion of it. Thank you. So, I always, I can, so, I'm a reader. I read a lot, <laughs> a lot, and that's how I actually got access to the moderator panel, because Dart knows how much I read. Um, and actually, one of the questions that are in the chat box, she just said, have you ever been embarrassed about a mistake you saw after publishing? And I want to say as a reader, I can tell when someone didn't have a strong editor. If I see typos, if I see, like there was this one book and I was just like, cool, did, did this person even have an editor? Like it was a great book, but there was like a couple of misspelled words and then one chapter, she switched who she was talking to in the middle of the chapter. I was like, but you was talking to Sarah, but now Anne is the one who she thought Anne was never in the room and you just switched from who you were talking to so you can definitely diminish the readability of a book <laughs> yes i'm always like mm. so you need to have a strong idea especially when you're putting out um books and novels and works out there in the world for people to read um so i wanted to let everyone know in the chat box these are great questions that you guys have we do have a q a section that we will have in later so please drop all the questions that you want answered by the panelists in the q a box so we can get to that when we get to that portion okay so I'm actually going to go to you, George, for a second. Um, yes. Because you made your career writing a lot of different mediums. So you wrote short stories, screenplays. How did you find the right avenue? And how did you navigate the different genres of your writing until you found your style? Um, it, was, it was really just one of those things where kind of like necessity is the mother of invention because um, I wanted to get a story out. I wanted to get something out there to the world. But if you are trying to write a screenplay, then you're basically asking for, you know, for a budget, for a director, for actors, for, you know, for lighting, for, you know, for everything, for a producer to really, you know, break everything down. If you are, if you just want to get this story out there, then you write the novel. You write, you know, like that is the best possible way to get it out there. And um, the way things are in Hollywood, you know, they're looking for novels to adapt. So instead of going the original screenplay route and wind, you know, like wind up being on, you know, in stacks upon stacks of unproduced screenplays, then what the best thing that you can possibly do is get your book out there in whichever way you want, whether it's self-publishing or traditional publishing, and find the audience that way, because that's when all of a sudden, you know, 
Hollywood will, you know, start looking in your direction. So for me, it was just a, a matter of wanting to get the story out, but not wanting, but not having any sort of means to actually get it done in a visual sense. Uh, so for me, it was just like, I, I just need, I need to get this out. So let me just concentrate on and nothing else but prose that I know I can do. I can't do art. My, you know, my sketch, my artistic, uh, you know, abilities go to like, you know, just a little bit above stick figures. Um, but I can definitely write. I feel like, you know, that's something I feel like much more confident in. So why not just go ahead and get it out there as best as I possibly can to, to, uh, to get it out there to the masses. Okay. Thank you. So we're actually going to launch our final poll question, which is going to ask, the publish me part. What is a publisher, guys? Do you guys know the definition? Okay, the answers are coming in slowly but surely. Okay, so about 80% of you guys actually got the question right. So a publisher is a personal company that prepares and issues books, journals, music, or other works for sale. My funniness was putting in there, a person that charges you 10% or more. That is actually not correct, even though it's the one I so picked that as the answer choice. So we're actually going to hop in right now to our publishers on the panel. So I'm actually going to start with Donna. You have actually written three poetry books that I personally own and I have read, and you have chosen to self-publish for each of your book releases. So what makes you choose to self-publish your book versus going to a publishing company? You're muted. I love how perfect your voice sounds every time you call me out on that, Tony. Thanks. <laughs> um, so the honest answer, the most honest answer is partially fear. Absolutely. Who wants to be rejected? Nobody wants to be rejected. Um, the other part of it is poetry, is poetry is becoming more and more sexy again, but it is not the sexiest um, field. And it's also not, it's overpopulated in some ways. So there's so many people out there writing poetry. You have to be somebody who's in journals. You have to be somebody that is winning awards. You have to be somebody in that, that slam circle. You have to be somebody who's making a bigger name than I currently am making for myself to actually get someone to say, yes, we want your book. Most of the people that, whose books you're seeing right now are published in a lot of journals before they got here or they won some huge competition or something like that where there was a lot of other people saying, oh, this is somebody you need to watch. And I'm, I'm a little girl from the Bronx and I'm not, and this is not to diminish my own voice, right? But it's just understanding that I don't have those accolades behind me yet. And therefore, but my, what I need to say is important. And I need to represent for all the little girls in the Bronx. I need to represent for all the black people who can't tell their story. I need to represent for all the Me Too people out there. And I need to represent for black women because we, we should say her name, right? So there's no reason why I should stop not like if I, I don't have those accolades yet. It's going to take me a while to build that up. It's going to take me a while to get in front of the right people, to get in front of the right people, get in front of the right people, to get me on a stage like some people like Jericho Brown. I'm not a professor. He's a professor doing his thing. Jericho Brown created his own form that's like killing it right now, right? So it's going to take me a while to get there. Not saying that I'm not, not saying it's outside the realm, but it's going to take a while. But what I needed to say was more important before then. And so I couldn't wait. And so therefore I had to write it myself. And the biggest thing is that also like, we know that we're not the ones, people who are like me are not the ones who are controlling the industry. Therefore, there's even more, like even when I do compete, I am aware that there's a level of how, how urban can I be or how black can I be when I write something and compete and put, submit my writing. Because 
who is reading it and who's the gatekeeper on answering that. And knowing all of that, that's the gatekeeper. Didn't say the word, but like, forget the gatekeeper. I'm going to be my own gatekeeper. I'm going to get those words out there on my own. Because you know what? My writing is in, I think the last time I counted, is in six countries and in 25 states. So clearly I'm doing something right by the way that I've been doing this hustle. And I didn't need a gatekeeper to say that I'm not strong, that I'm not, because I didn't get an award, because I wasn't on some panel, because I wasn't on some show, that I shouldn't be heard. Clearly I'm being heard. So that's why I chose this route, because I knew that I could, I knew I had enough confidence in what I could do to make it heard for everybody else. Okay, so Tony, you're a poet, author, and founder of your own publishing company. When and why did you decide to create and run your own publishing company? Almost did what she did. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> um, so the, I think I said a little bit about it at the beginning um, or with another question, but it was basically running an open mic. Um, I ran into people from various experience levels. So from just beginning to, you know, have been doing open mics for decades. And I've, in each period or of experience, like I've met people that said that I want to, I want to do a book. And then it was people in the later periods, 10 years plus that said, I always wanted to do a book, but never got around to doing it or never did this. And I knew that I didn't want to be that and so I went ahead and I, and I did it um, because I needed to, to get that out. Um, but when I saw that there were people that were young, as um, far as new, newbies in, in, the, in, in the poetry realm, and they wanted to do it, and it was just like, how do I do it? And then when I went through it and I saw that, okay, well, you have to know this piece, that piece, this piece, this piece, this piece. And I was lucky enough to be a visual artist and have digital graphic design as experience in my past. So that helped out a lot of the technical things uh, of doing that. Um, and so, um, so I was able to, to do that. And then I also had to edit editing a friend that was an editor. So if you don't have those resources, then you can't really, you know, you can't really, you really won't produce a product that, um, how can I say it? That would be quality. That would that would be a a product that would, I don't know. It, it without the resources, you know. So I wanted to create a company that kind of educated the person first, like took a person in that may not, you know, they're uh, not just any poet, but someone that actually has you know, a craft that they have perfected or, or they have a gift for words. So I, I wanted to create a place where they can actually come in with their work. We actually work together to create a more polished, you know, edited and creatively edited as well um, piece of work. And, and then they actually produce a product that they can feel proud of. And then also, not only that, but that the world will also be intrigued by and, and, and enjoy the experience of going through their, their book and, and going through their story. And so that, that's kind of the journey to being a self, to, to being a, a, a small press publisher. And that is always rooted on my passion for, for both people and poetry. So. Thanks. Okay, so with Amazon Blurb and other companies, there are easy ways that people can self-publish their work. Mm -hmm. um, authors can still self-publish and then get picked up after they have built their brand and get noticed by a publishing company. Um, and George, I know that you switched from self-publishing to working with a publishing house. Um, yes, yes. What advice, um, George, you can start this and anyone else can answer. What advice would you give to authors who have self-published previously but are now looking to be picked up by a publishing company? Um, well, it, uh, what I would definitely say is, uh, the first thing that I would say is, uh, make sure that you have another story in your, um, in your queue that, uh, that you want to get out there because a lot of cases with a lot of publishers, what they will, as soon as a book has been self-published, then they likely won't want anything to do with it, um, because it's already out there. In my case, it was a 
there were a lot of connections that, that happened that got um, Excelsior where it is because it started out as a, as a self-published book in 2010. Um, and then in 2013, it was a small press with only a handful of titles that they had in their catalog that, um, that went ahead and said that they wanted to take a chance on it. And they wound up doing very well with it. But what they did, which, was, which I was really appreciative of, was they allowed me to look back at that old manuscript and rework it. You know, if I needed to, if there was anything else that I felt that needed to be changed, then I should go ahead and do that. And they said they were going to just release it as a second edition anyway. So that gave me the green light from March until about August and September of 2013 to basically completely rework most of, most of that book, most of that first book. And, um, and then when it came out in 2013 with a brand new cover and everything, it, um, it did very well for that publisher. But when they closed up shop in 2016, that was when I got a contact from a different small press that, um, that I just only happened to know because one of my best friends and uh, Dara, you know, one of yours as well, Rebecca Jaycox, uh, she, is, she became the editor for that publishing house. And she was talking up my book to that publisher. And so they, you know, they took a look at it and they said, do you mind if we go ahead and take a, take a um, try to, you know, work with you to kind of rework the middle part? Because we feel that the, uh, the character development could use a little extra work. And I said, I, I just want this to be the best it can be. So have at it. And Rebecca, God bless her, she had at it because she took a sledgehammer to the whole damn thing. And um, so I was working for about like a, a couple of months to basically just kind of rework that whole book once again from start to finish. Um, but it's better than it's ever been right now. And so um, I would say if you're, if you're able to get a publisher that will go ahead and take a chance on your book, be open to any sort of changes that need to be made because they are taking a chance on you. It's not just you grunting the, the whole thing yourself as a self-publisher um, because what they're, what they're offering is they're offering their assistance in terms of getting it out there. Now, they're not going to market for you. Uh, that's still up to you. That's, that's the same with any sort of, any traditionally published author. You know, you are still going to have to do the legwork in order to get the book out there to as many people as possible. Um, but you want also want it to be the best it can be. And they are providing the opportunity for you to do that. So listen, be open. And if you're, if you are so in love with everything that you've done that you don't want to change anything, stick to self-publishing. Uh -oh. I wanted to just piggyback off of one of the things that he said, um, which w was, um, oh yeah, that you're going to do the, you're going to also have to do some leg legwork with with it. Um, with publishing, I always say, it's a joining of two brands when mm -hmm. I talk to my authors. So they have a brand. And one of the cases that I use, and I'm sorry that I'm heavily in poetry, but uh, that is my realm, um, but Rupi Carr, um, she, actually, she actually started off self-published and she built her brand online before, and that's her following. So if a company pulls, pulls you in and now is, going to dis and now is going to help you distribute or publish your work, you have to think of yourself as a brand. You have your followers because the publisher only gets publishing rights to publish your work. They're not your marketing agent. They're not your publicist. Like they're not, um, they're, I'm, I'm trying to think of another example, but they, basically you're going to be in charge of, you know, getting yourself out there for interviews, you know, Okay, you have a, a radio station nearby. You, okay, or you have to call that station. Now, in, in my case, I actually kind of work with, because I'm a small press, so I, I kind of take on the project as, as my own. So um, I work with them to kind of walk them through the steps, you know, but we work together. But that is your responsibility as, as an author. You're not just someone that wrote words and then 
sit back and collect a check. <laughs> oh, that's that's not it. You're you're a brand. You are actually a company after that. Basically, you you and you should function that way. The the money from the book, you know, don't think of it all as just income. You know, put some money aside to invest in other things, merchandise. You know, those 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 things. So always consider yourself as a brand. I want to just interject really quickly um, to add on to that. Uh, one of the things that, uh, that just came to mind right now is that uh, I will say that, uh, that it's, not just, um, it's not just small presses that will take a chance and, re and republish your work mm -hmm. because there are those success stories. There are very few of them, but there are there um, that become a real sensation in the self-publishing field. And then mm -hmm. another, a publisher sweeps in and what they do is they basically set it out there to the, to the masses. Um, two, two big examples are Hugh Howey, um, who created this, uh, this story called Wool. And he put it out on Amazon during a time when self-publishing on Amazon was really still pretty new. Um, but it was getting out there. And all of a sudden, you know, like things really started to pick up with that. And, um, and it became like this real big self-publishing sensation. So a publisher came in, I think it was Simon and Schuster, and they went ahead and, you know, went ahead and made a deal with them. And what Hugh was able to do was he basically said, I want to carve out the ebook rights. And so he allowed, he was able to continue to publish the ebook under his own name, mm -hmm. but still the, the print version was able to go out to bookstores and become a huge bestseller. Um, and another one, I believe his name was uh, Andy Weir, who uh, created The Martian. And um, he's someone who self-published this story by, by putting it out in increments on his blog. And that started getting the attention of the publishing world. They, they come in, they go ahead and make the deal with them to get the, the full complete book out there. And it gets out there in both print and ebook. And then obviously, you know, Hollywood comes calling and boom, it's, be it's become a, a huge blockbuster film with Matt Damon. So it does happen. It's not often, but it does happen. Mm -hmm. so, so I just want to say one, what Tony was saying in the short version is always be selling because mm -hmm. you always have to be promoting yourself out there, whether you find the brand to go with it or something, you find a way to make it happen. And even to George is one of the most famous, um, if you don't know anything about literature out there, Fifty Shades of Grey was self-published. Yeah. <laughs> Self-published so as Twilight fan fiction. <laughs> That's one. It's another thing that pe that people need to be <laughs> need to be aware of. <laughs> yeah. It's it's funny. There's that part of me that wants to say like, oh, traditional publishing. You do get a publicist. You do have a marketing team, and you you do technically. You do technically. <laughs> <laughs> they just don't always do that much. Um, <laughs> so it's. You know, not, I hope no publicist is currently in the room. But, but they, you know, there are so many people being picked up by publishers that they are only choosing to focus all of their publicity and marketing spends on a, a small percentage of what they take on. Mm -hmm. So it's true. Even if you're traditionally published, you have to be out there. You have to be hustling. Um, it's, it's less in your hands than it is when you're self-published, but it is still an important part of the process um, mm -hmm. everywhere along the way. Okay. Oh, also, also, I just want to say one thing. Um, the other thing about publishing, um, if you try to self-publish and try to go into like a bookstore, you're probably not going to be able to get into the bookstore because of the fact that they they have you they purchase their books from catalogs and so you have to be a publisher to be in the catalog um or pay to be into the catalog so you know trying to go into um and this and this is actually an accounting thing so instead of actually buying from multiple self-published authors you know where now they have to write invoices and, and stuff to individuals they can actually purchase their books through one catalog one shipping and it comes to their to their door and with small bookstores they have to manage their overhead you know so so it does depend um because I mean, it depends on the type it depends on it depends and it's absolutely true there is immediately a barrier 
when you do it certain ways, you're immediately told your books cannot go through certain avenues if you're doing self-published. However, I can tell you for a fact, my and libraries is one of the other one. That's the other place that it can't get into so easily. Mm -hmm. But I am in a library. I'm in a few libraries. I didn't do anything. People just requested me. So they still did the work because people in their town asked for it. Um, and you can be in bookstores, mm -hmm. like big bookstores, Barnes and Noble automatically pulls it from a catalog. So you're technically there. It just takes a while longer. It takes more, it, take, it cuts a lot more money out of your pocket, depending how you self publish the book yourself. But also you can go a lot of places. I'm at, Tony knows this. Um, I'm actually doing another event in a couple of weeks where I'm now having my book being uh, consi on consignment in Iowa, because somebody said you need to bring this author here. And so we're working on that partnership right now, you know, so you can get into the stores. Your avenue in is definitely different and it's a different level of work. I, I also want to add on to that as well, because um, I, um, for several months in 2019, I was working at Barnes and Noble. And so it was, it was a real great opportunity for me to really kind of see what it was that they're looking for. And a big thing that they're looking for, and this is something that I learned, um, uh, you know, not too long, you know, not too long ago. Um, they, yeah, they have their own catalog to go through, but the main, th the main, uh, the main mistake that a lot of people make when they go to, into self-publishing is they go through Amazon to go through the KDP uh, setup and they take Amazon's ISBN that they provide for free. What you want to do is if you really want to go in that, in, in the full self-publishing realm, but you also want to be able to have book signings and have, you know, like get your books in the stores, even in Barnes and Noble. The best thing for you to do is to one, own your own ISBN and you can get that from Valkers.com. Um, they have, they have deals, they have bulk deals where you can get it like 10 uh, ISBNs for like a certain price. Um, and there's also, um, yeah, B-O-W-K-E-R-S.com. And, uh, the other thing that you want to do is you want to work with IngramSpark.com. And what that is, that is working with, uh, with the Ingram printers that will allow you to get into the Barnes & Noble catalog. Because um, if you just have your book self-published through Amazon and Barnes & Noble looks it up and everything, there's no way that they can get it because the only route that they can go to get it is through Amazon, which is their competition which is w what wants to put them out of business. So the last thing they want to do is purchase from their main competitor. But if you have it set up with Ingram Spark using the same ISBN, then it'll show up in both places. You'll be able to get it from Amazon without any issues, but you'll also be able to go through, go into the Barnes & Noble catalog, see that it's there and request it. So, you know, like I've done, I've done several signings with, uh, with Barnes & Noble so far and because it was set up that way um i was able you know they're able to turn around and get as many copies as they want from my books from either a loris publishing which is the one that's holding that is currently printing excelsior and its sequel ever upward um and um through ingram spark which is where i have my five-part serial from parts unknown out so there are two different routes that that uh that you definitely need to explore if you want to get your book out there in as many avenues as possible. Thank you. Okay, so we kind of jumped into the conversation already, started talking about accounting and about things you need to buy, um, ISBN numbers. So let's get into the finances of writing. So people really talk about the finances when they think about writing. Writing a book can take a lot of funds. So when you consider that you might have to pay for cover designers, editors, publishers, Etc. Um, one, what's sunken cost going to making a book? What is the cost for editors when they are writing, um, for authors when they are writing their book? And then, how do our writers on this call make sure they're not losing all their money before they make any when they release their book? So, so I'm like biting at the chomp for this one because what I will tell you from the jump, because there's a disagreement upon this panel immediately is that no matter how you do it, there's a cost to you as a writer. So either you're not making everything because that 10% is not 10%, it's more than 10%. So it's not what's coming straight to you or it's what you spend in making the work yourself. So no matter what, there's people, if you're, if you're going through a traditional route, there's people who are getting paid 
Think about every musician you ever heard of who said, I made a platinum record and I got $10 because there's people getting paid. That's still the industry to some extent, right? Even if you're doing it on a small level. If you're doing it yourself, it really depends. And that's why I wrote in the chat before, it really depends on your resources. Your resources are everything because I have just enough visual arts ability. I have just enough network who can actually edit stuff. I have just enough of my own abilities to catch typos or my just enough to, uh, people who will help me make a flyer. I have just enough of those people in my network that for my first three books, if you total all three books, other than like, when you're talking about the ISBN, you're talking about the copyright, um, you're talking about, I, I won't add in buying the books themselves to sell because that's a whole different part of it. But, um, cause I, and you don't have to pay a lot for proofs, like that there's not a lot of cost there. I have done those books for probably under $500 when you don't include buying the books to go be a vendor. So, because I, and part of that cost was like the ISBNs, Part of that cost, maybe maybe more than 500, but um, it's the ISBNs, it's accidentally overpaying for Photoshop um, to be able to actually make my cover the cover I needed to be. So it's supposed to be a month, I had it for like six months, you know, that's the cost. But like, it really depends on what your own skill set is and what you have the ability to do. But now, right now, because I'm working on my memoir that hopefully will drop at the beginning of the year, if I can pull everything together to get to the editor part of it and the other parts of it, um, I do have my cover, but I couldn't do my, the artwork I wanted, I could not do. So therefore I now had to bring in an artist. And then because I know my prose writing is not gonna be as tight as my poetry, now I gotta go be, pay an editor. So my costs are going up exponentially really quickly, but I also plan for that. So I put money, I've been saving this whole COVID Every extra dollar is going into a savings account so I can pay these people so that the book can be as great as it can. And here's the other thing, and this is not, I'm not advocating for this, but understand the reason why Trump paid $750 was because he took a lot of L's. that were not even, we're not even going to go into what the legitimacy of his L's were, of all his losses. But because I'm a, I go out and vend, I'm a vendor all the time, I'm paying tabling fees. That's where my money's disappearing in, is that I'm going out to all these different expos and those expos cost money and they're not necessarily going to equal that. But what they do is every time I'm at a table, there's somebody taking a picture with me. There's noise around me that I don't remember to do on a daily basis or on a weekly basis. I don't promote as well as Tony does. So therefore, me being at a table is me promoting. Today, I'm at an event, so now you're gonna see me at a table and you're gonna see 20 pictures today. And those pictures will come back in my feed every now and then I'll be like, oh, remember last week when I did that? Did you get the book yet? So for me, that's what I'm paying for when I'm actually vending. And so those are costs that are part of it too. And because I'm taking those L's, because I had to get a new computer, because I had to buy Word where I wasn't buying it before, because now I have to pay my tax person more money because they're now a specialist because I now have to do a 1040, 1040 is that the 1099? You have to do a 1099 now because I'm a specialized person independently. I'm taking those L's and I'm not really mad about it because my taxes are different because I'm investing in a business. See what I'm saying? So there's ways in which if you're, if you're tracking all your money properly, even if you're spending a lot, if you have the product and you are making something, you can still deduct that when you're getting to your taxes. So what you're spending price-wise, it really, like you have to be investing in you and you have to know that tomorrow you'll be an overnight success after the 50,000 years you spent writing. So there is cost, no matter how you do it, there's cost, but it depends on what the product you wanna make is and how much skills you have to make it on your own. Because if you have some of those skills, you can cut those costs. I have made all three of my, my book covers and they're not that bad. They fit what I want them to be. They work for what I, they send the message I need them to send. Wonderful. What, when you see my next cover, you understand that I don't have that graphic skills. So then you got to go, go to a professional. And that's when you, so you just have to balance with your courses. You, you, you budget. It can be nothing. It can be 500 bucks. It can be three grand. It all depends on what you want to do and how far you want to take it if you're doing it as an independent person. But somebody else is going to take your money no matter what you do if you don't do it this way. Also, just to just to throw it out there, there are a lot of editors. If you're going to you know work with, um, obviously, uh, a big key to success is working with a really good editor. But there are those editors that are just they're not going to jive with you in terms of like the kind of story that you write or the kind of work that you do. Um, so one of the things that, uh, that you always want to make sure you're doing is not just jumping at that first one that you see. 
You want to make sure that they're the right fit for you. And you also want to see if um, what a lot of what a lot of editors will do is they will they'll say, you know, say like send over 2000 words and I'll go ahead and edit those for free. And if, if you liked what they had to do, what you liked what they had to offer, then great. Then you can go forward. But um, but definitely, you know, make sure you're doing your homework with with all these things. Make sure that that the that the editor is right for you. Make sure the cover designer, if you go, if you go in that direction, is right for you. Um, look at look at their portfolios. See what they you know. See what kind of work they can do, and then see if that if you feel like that's going to uh, do the best possible favor for your book. So to piggyback off of that. Um, the investing in yourself. Um, for editors, it, I think it's more about the value that you're going to get out of that editor versus the cost. Um, there are some very cheap editors and a lot of people, from my experience, like I've had people turn down some of my services because they're like, oh, well, you know, I have someone else who can do it for, you know, this much low, lo <laughs> this much lower than what you're, you know, charging. But I've also had some of those same people come back to me and be like, oh, well, they didn't do what I thought they would do. So I don't think, don't always go with the cheapest, but it doesn't mean you always have to go with the most expensive either. Look at, um, like George said, look at what that editor is offering you, the types of services, what you're going to get out of that service, depending on the time frame that your project is going to be. There are some editors that you know, price each service separately. You know, it's like you got to pay this for copy editing, this for proofreading, this for developmental editing. And then there are people like me that kind of do it as a bundle. It's like, so once we go through this developmental part of it, you know, if you need a second round of edits, then I will go through that as well. You know, it's, it's part of, again, the value <laughs> in that editor and what you're willing to spend and invest in your project. Because as we mentioned before, the goal of publishing a book is to get the maximum readability out of it. A lot of times people, they skimp on the editing because they think, oh, well, I caught most of the big stuff, but that can diminish your sales because it could be a great story. But if people can't get through the book, they're wondering, well, you know, they didn't have an editor or, you know, I don't want to finish this book. Or even if they read a preview of the book or something and they catch all this stuff, they're like, oh, I'm not going to buy that. I'm going to have trouble reading through this. And you'll also get bad reviews, which also diminish your sales as well. I wanted to jump in because I like to be really specific about uh, the costs of traditional publishing, which as Dara pointed out, they are there. Um, they just happen differently. I would say you should never work with any literary agent who charges you a single cent before they have sold your work. We should only be paid a percentage of what you make. So we, uh, I personally, and most agents I know, charge a 15% commission off of the income that you pull in. But we only see that once we've actually done our job and sold your book. And there are a lot of, um, advantages to traditional publishing in this side because you don't have to pay for your editor and you don't have to pay the cover cost, but you also see a smaller percentage of the earnings. So if you take eBooks, if you're traditionally published, 25% uh, of what the publisher received is credited to your account. If you self-publish, 70% of what you list for on Amazon is given to you. You're getting a higher amount back self-publishing, absolutely. The question is the trade-off, is you know, having the control and having the access uh, going to be significant enough for you to move enough copies for you to sort of outsell what a publisher who has more of a marketing and publicity machine behind them and has the accounts with traditional retailers um, already in place, you know, how, what's the trade-off? Um, and that's where I think you need to look at, at the expenses um, and look at the potential earnings because the potential earnings are higher on the self-publishing side um, per copy, but the potential reach is higher on the traditional side when you look at authors like Hugh Howey um, or Andy Martin, who George brought up, uh, who were bestsellers self-publishing but chose then to go a traditional route because they had access to avenues they didn't have before. So it's all about sort of taking these numbers and analyzing them and deciding what's best for you. 
And to go back to Dara's point earlier, I, it, 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 there is this question of access and availability. Um, it is not outside of my knowledge that publishing is a very uh, white industry where I think the most recent study is 79% of all people who work in publishing are white. Access to black and brown communities is not what it should be. It's not as easy as it should be. Uh, that is another factor that has to go into the consideration. I think and hope we're making strides as an industry, but we're certainly not where we need to be. Okay, so I'm going to actually hop into the Q&A section. We have a lot of questions in the chat and I want to get space and time to get to it. Um, and Cody wants to answer all of them as I see. <laughs> all of them, okay. I not say all of them. I <laughs> Well, I, I skipped okay. a few, one and two, skipped a few, you know? <laughs> well, let's get into, you wrote the book, you got your editor, you got your publisher, it's ready to be released. How do you get it out there for sale? So um, one of our audience members actually um, asked that she's technically a published, self-published author, and for the past two years, she's been having a really hard time promoting the book and being consistent in doing it. So do you guys have any tips on how to successfully self publish and enlarge your platform? Um, there is um, there is safety in numbers. I will say that. Um, I would say to uh, to basically just kind of connect with as many uh, with as many self-published authors that are out there in your genre um, on in on uh, you know various social media platforms. They are all over the place. Um, you know like on Twitter you look under you know hashtag writing community um, hashtag am writing. That's the biggest writing related hashtag, um, in all of Twitter right now. Um, and because the main reason why is not to just say, you know, let's swap books or whatever, because then you're not getting anywhere. That's, you might as well just run on a treadmill. You actually want to get somewhere. What you want to do is you want to, um, one thing that really helped me during the time when Excelsior was out there before it made the, it made the jump to the small press was I basically just worked with like a, bun a handful of different authors. And what we would do is instead of putting out their links saying like, buy my book, buy my book, buy my book, it was buy his book and then buy her book and then buy, you know, like buy his book too. And then her book, you know, like just so that way you have a whole bunch of different people that you can promote and they will do the same for you because that's what will get a lot of, a lot more, more attention. Because just saying, buy my book, buy my book, buy my book, that's all white noise. That gets canceled out so quickly. There are so many people that are basically just inundated with that. And for huge thing, if you're on Twitter, do not, under any circumstances, send anyone a direct message with your link as soon as they start following you. Do not do that. I've seen that way too often. It is a huge red flag, and it's one huge step toward unfollowing someone yeah. because what you got to what you got to remember is twitter is not is not where you sell your books it's where you sell you and they you know like by getting in touch with people and everything by you know mingling with them by asking questions by being a part of conversations that's what will get people's attention and all of a sudden they'll want to know what you have to offer um think of it this way twitter is the world's biggest virtual cocktail party you do not show up to a cocktail party with a bunch of your books under your arm. So, you know, like what you want to do is you want to mingle. You want to chat. You want to get to know these people. And guess what? They want to get to know you. So by doing that, you're able to, you're able to use that, what, you know, th those means to sell your book. So say like for, you know, 10 different tweets that you do that are either, you know, starting a conversation or putting out a question uh, creating like an open end, you know, conversation, answering other people, getting to know them and everything, say for like 10 of those, then drop a link for your book and then another 10 and then drop a link to your book. So you want to, you obviously want to get your book out there, but you want to do it in a very stealth like manner. You don't want to just like spam people with, with your links. That is the first step toward them not caring about who you are. So I, I will just repeat what I said before is that I'm a vendor. 
I will invest at going to places and being at a table because what George is really also talking about, like I hate Twitter only because it feels like a big old chat room from AOL and I can't, it, I get lost in those, I get lost in this. Um, but it is about people will, especially if you're doing this on your own, if you're doing it as a small person or a new writer, people will buy you. They're not necessarily buying the book. There's so many people who buy my book who never read it. And there's so many people whose books I've bought and I haven't read. I don't have the capacity and time to write and read simultaneously and do everything that my hands are in, right? But I can, by being at a table, by being a vendor and engaging people, the first question I ask people, no matter what they say when they come to my table, I was like, do you like poetry? And then no matter what answer they give me, I have an answer for that. They say, yes. I say, great. I have a book for you. Let's talk about this. They say, no. I said, why? Did Shakespeare scare you? And then we have a conversation about how relatable and easy my writing is to pick up. So there's, you have to have the answers behind that. But by being out there, by physically being there, by being at the events, if you're a schmoozing, like be at the events, schmooze with people. And when you're friending people, you find out what events exist. There's people who didn't know what event existed before. But now I've been at this event. I like I go to the Urban League event and then I table with people. And I was like, oh, but girl, you need to go to this one, this one, and that one. These are the other events you need to target to go sell because you have the right thing that's going to sell to somewhere else. So you you have to know the uh, as George said, you have to know the other people, find out what their resources are, and not just like take it, but like connect. And then like you know what, you two split a table. That table fee is four hundred bucks, but they allow you to have an extra person on that table. Bet let's do that. Or, you know what, they don't let you have a set, an extra person at the table, but you're going in as an independent author. We're just going to slide my book on the table with you, and I'm going to help you do the sale. <laughs> you know, there's ways around. You have to be present. I think that's the biggest thing, no matter how, what, if you're doing it digitally, you're in person, whatever, you have to be present. People have to know you exist. And I absolutely advocate for sharing resources. This is not a competition. I know so many poets, they doing their thing. They, they killing it. They're killing it in ways that I'm just like, how did I not do that? How do I learn? What do I, but like, it's not a competition. I can learn from them, but their success is not in competition to my success because I'm writing something different. So therefore we can build together and you always, like just always have somebody else's name in your mouth. When I'm talking about this event in Iowa, the first thing I said is great. I know a publisher that would be really great to interview me and he's releasing some books and you may want him on your shelf too. So I immediately talking about myself and then I'm putting Tony's name right in there and we have a meeting next week. So it's about making that network because you know what? Tony's going to say my name next time or Tony's going to put me on to one of his events or something like that or we're partners. But, you know, you know, we do the, you got to work together. It's all about your resources and your network. They say your network is your net worth. They ain't lying, especially when it comes to this industry. So, okay. So, um, oh, sorry. We need to move. <laughs> I, I just want I wanted to pull in another question um, that kind of is with this one um, because one of the people asked about COVID because you know vendoring and stuff that like that question. is okay. is is actually difficult in these times especially if you have anxiety or anything like that because <laughs> um, you so so you don't really if if you are like. You're, you're not trying to go out in, in the public. And so I have really found social media to be something that I have been able to kind of mas master, I guess you can say, um, with, with visuals as well as events and stuff like that and maneuvering around um, the COVID. Because I actually started um, Poetics University, which if you haven't heard of it, um, this is not this event. <laughs> it's not for this event, but um, it's, a, it's basically an institute for artist development for poets, um, particularly. But I did, I started it and, and we built it inside of COVID. And what, what I've learned is that um, people are listening to online presence right now because we have nothing else to do. So the, and if you saw celebrities also took to, to Instagram because they, or um, social media, because they did not have the avenues like big, large concerts, you know, in, in the people that actually, you know, maneuvered around it, grew in following, they grew in exposure, they found new ways to actually get revenue out of 
you know, this, this situation. So for you, you have a self-published book. You now can't actually go to an open mic, can't go to an event or event. I mean, it's opening up, but if you don't want to, then you need to sell yourself on social media. And that's not saying what, he, what, what George just said, don't drop your, your link to everybody, you know, on, on social media, but grow your following, grow the value in your, in your book, grow the value in who you are. So go on social media and either make a, make a post at, um, on a regular basis, treat it like a business. How often are you going to post something, you know, that does not necessarily have to be, be about your book. You should kind of stagger it. Um, but post post your words what kind of motivational thing that that you can post that somebody would stop and say like you know or save uh, which i just found out save is actually a big thing i haven't i have to dive more into the research but save is actually a big component of social media um for instagram in particular but how maybe you can go live read from your book a little bit Maybe you can also get involved in the writing community and actually do your own event. I've One of my authors is actually doing their own open mic and that's getting them entrenched in the community. They're doing something to network, just like Dara said, it's a networking possibility because you're doing it, they saw your ad, they're gonna follow you. And, and that is a potential client, they're going to support you. And, and so you do these things to, enrich yourself inside of the community inside of this industry and people and also go to other people's things as well the, di the digital um open mics or the digital writing workshops digital seminars like this you know now you actually know a a author a publisher a self-published author uh um uh, a literary agent and an editor so you can reach out to us and we're going to um, share that at the end but um, you can reach out to us for questions or you can reach out to us for advice and stuff like that I don't know how they are as far as advice but uh, <laughs> I know I, I will I will be open and I know that I mean they, they came and did this so I know that pretty much they're good people so they they will give you give you advice as well and they probably would look forward to it because we we want to share what we've learned over the journey that we have been doing this that's why we're here actually <laughs> uh, just to say that none of us are paid to be here <laughs> so we are doing this because we we care go ahead okay i also um, want to um i'm sorry i just i there are just two quick things i just want to throw out there um first of all like um you guys might notice i have a you know fairly elaborate setup over here um, it's because this is my recording studio in my office, and there are two major things that happen here that I believe that a lot of you would benefit from. First of all, I record, I narrate audiobooks um, because one of the big things is audio is becoming a huge platform for writers to to get their works out there. Audiobook is the is that's the third that's a third piece of the triangle that you definitely want to make sure that you take advantage of. And ACX, the Audiobook Creation Exchange, really offers the chance to allow, you know, like a lot of independent authors to really take advantage of what they offer. Uh, because there are a lot of different narrators that are out there that will do what they call a royalty share, which means no money up front. Now, granted, you are getting what you pay for. You are, you know, like these, these narrators have to know that you are going to do everything you possibly can to sell as much as you can because every sale on that uh, on that audiobook you're getting 20 percent they're getting 20 percent and then amazon is getting 60 because it's their platform um so that is that is definitely uh an avenue that you want to explore another one is podcasts and i'm not saying to run your own podcast i have my own but there are hundreds of thousands of podcasts that are out there that always need guests and that's where you come in so take a look and see like what what sort of uh what sort of uh facebook groups that are out there i think there's there's one that's called like podcast guest connection or something and that will allow you to basically just kind of put yourself out there and just say hey i am this and this and this i have i'm an author of this i have this out there you know provide a link or whatever and and hosts will reach out to you um, and also you want to, you know, reach out, you know, take a look at your, at the different types of podcasts that are out there. 
that are uh, that involve writing and that will allow you know like they'll you know they'll give you the the option of reaching out to them and say can i be a guest you know and so you have those options also to play with so um as i said at the very beginning the internet is providing limitless opportunities those two are two very big ones okay so for the remainder of the q a questions i want to ask everyone try to refrain um try to keep your answers to 60 seconds or less so we can try to get through as many as possible um but just to recap i know that i put in the chat um that COVID has happened, but things are being digital. You can be a digital vendor. A lot of events are going digital as well. Um, you can also be doing digital readings. You can be getting your work out that way. Um, if you didn't see the chat, that's another answer that she gave. One uh, Another question we have is, how has this space evolved due to digital and social media? Do you see unique opportunities in this new world of content creation as potential revenue streams for authors? Have you seen any other connections to what could have be used as a traditional writing? Or has the two remained separate from traditional and um, online with digital and social media? I think there's space for you to 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 go traditional and and um, and independent. I think there's um, sort of an increasing awareness in publishing that uh, the two are different and they serve different needs. They reach different readerships. Uh, so it's not as as cut and dry as it used to be. Where if you're self published. You can't be traditionally published or you know you look to be self-published and then make the leap to traditional publishing and then never go back it's just not really that way anymore uh, there are hybrid authors people um, my company works with like colleen hoover or um, abby glines who who really have uh found a way to to blend the two um so i think there are increasing opportunities absolutely yeah, definitely. Um, I myself am a, am a hybrid author, and um, the only reason why the um, why the why um, Excelsior and Ever Upward and the upcoming sequel Greater Glory, they are they're traditionally published because they have a much more universal feel. My five part serial from Parts Unknown is very niche, and so I opted to just go the self publishing route with that. Okay, so we had a question about the ISBN number. Um, the audience member doesn't fully understand. So can you explain the uses and why you, you do need them or you don't need them? And if you need them, how do you go about getting them, especially if your pockets are kind of shot? <laughs> um, yes, yeah, definitely. Uh, the ISBN, what that is, it's an international standard book number. And you definitely need one of those if your book is going to get anywhere outside your garage. Um, so that is that is highly 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 important every single vendor needs that in order to properly catalog your book and get and to sell it for you if you plan on selling it from either your home or your website your own specific website if that's the only type of publishing you want to do if that's the only type of selling you want to do then fine but if you want your book in, on amazon then you need an isbn number that's why they provide a free one now, granted, as I said before, that free one, that limits you to basically like being an Am on the Amazon catalog and not anywhere else. Um, so there will be deals through backers.com to, uh, to purchase your own ISBN number if you really want to get it out there. Um, but I would strongly suggest, you know, like, uh, you know, only purchasing through them. There are a lot of places that, you know, that are, that are saying that, oh, we have cheap ISBNs, don't do those because there's always a chance that that number could have already been used somewhere else. Mm -hmm. It's it's like a social security number for your book. I, um, oh, was said to me. Perfect and, way. <laughs> yeah, so basically all of your, all of the book's information is attached to the ISBN. If so, and that's what the barcode is on the back of every book. So it's uh, international, I forgot what it stands for, ISBN. But um, it's like if you scan it, it, you can tell everything about the book or the product in a barcode situation. And if you're going to go self-publish, I highly recommend buying the bundle because you buy the individual, you bought it for 200 bucks, you buy the pack, you buy it for like 300 bucks and you get 10. See the math there? And the odds are good that if you mess up, because I've, we've known public people who self-publish, who left their um, artwork in there that was just like the, the draft artwork and not the real artwork. So now you got to pull the book and do it again. 
every time you change even a word inside of the book, your ISBN has to change. So just in case you make mistakes and you want to pull your book back and then put it back again, you want to have more than one because otherwise if you buy them one off, you're now spending hundreds and thousands of dollars that you didn't need to spend. Um, or if you decide, you know, like I wrote the first book, I bought one because I was like, I'm only going to write this one book. And here I am two in working on my third and I have that concept, of, I mean my fourth and I'm working on five and six as well. So therefore, this pack is going to be going real quick, <laughs> but you just never know because you sort of get addicted. So buy the belt. Okay, so we had a question. Um, I think Dominique, you mentioned about the better the better readers. Um, so how do you organize your better readers, and is there a structure you would recommend for a remote platform for people to read the book? Or you might not have mentioned. Someone mentioned better readers, people who read your book before you actually release it. So I think when you're looking for beta readers, you just want to find people who are usually you want to find people who are also writers and who write uh, similar things to what you do. Uh, so you sort of look for online writing communities uh, that you can join. They should be free, um, free internet platforms um, and and see if anyone wants to volunteer to be a beta reader. Or talk about what your book is and see if it's a fit for anyone. And, and it, it really is just a, sort of a process of finding, uh, finding writers to be friends with um, who you can sort of trade reads with. So, you know, um, if, if Dar and Tony, you know, wanted to like exchange works so they could critique each other. Um, it's just about finding someone who, who does what you do and can give their feedback um, uh, uh, with, from their similar knowledge base. I think um, a good platform, just because I've seen it a lot more recently, is Wattpad, or I think it's like W-A-T-T-Pad.com. A lot of people share their stories on there first before they actually go and get their books published, because I've seen a lot of them, um, they do mention in there, like, this book was published, you know, after I wrote all of these. They get a lot of good feedback, and people can let them know to keep writing, because a lot of people do it in pieces. So they're like, oh, do you want to read more? And if the story is good enough, some people do go and get their books published. Okay, so the audience also wants to know about the importance of contracts when it comes to being an author, getting your books out, editing, um, agents. Yeah, I am, um, I'm actually, I don't know on the self-publishing side, so, so um, you'll all have to jump in on that side. Um, if you just, if you sell a book uh, to a traditional publisher, you're going to sign a contract that's usually somewhere between like 15 and 25 pages long. Um, it is usually not um, incredibly kind to the author, uh, which is why I I mean I am an agent, so I'm I'm very biased in saying this, um, but it's why I think you want an agent um, is so that you have somebody who's well versed in contracts and who can vet them for you and make sure they're. Um, as author friendly as humanly possible. You're also gonna have a, a, an agreement with your agent if you if you choose to go that route. Um, and I think that websites like uh, Writers Beware, I'll type these in the chat, uh, Writers Beware or Query Tracker are places that you can find a lot of information about what agents are out there and can ask questions about sort of their agreements um, their terms, what you should be looking for, what you should be aware, uh, be aware of. Um, yeah. Okay. So when you are choosing an agent or editor or publisher, what is the best way to find one that's willing to work for you, work with you? So as far as editors go, um, like I mentioned before, doing your research and figuring out how they go about packaging their products and how they go about um, pricing and getting the consultation because that's the only way you're gonna hear from them how their process is, you know, how they react to what your vision is and kind of get a feel for what type of business person they are and then their characteristics as a person, I feel like, because, because I'm such an avid reader and how excited I get, I think people can hear the excitement when I'm talking to them about their book and their ideas and what their vision looks like. And me being excited along with them lets them know like, okay, I'm in good hands. <laughs> um, I'm, just, I'm not to plug myself, but I'm gonna uh, send my Twitter feed to the uh, chat 
because my pin tweet is a list of 20 questions you should ask any agent who offers you representation. Um, and I think hopefully it's a good, it's a guide, guidelines to making sure that you're finding somebody who's reputable and who's a good match for you. Um, and it gives a lot more information than I can give um, in the limited time we have left. And I would just say, not necessarily using your friends um, and because the contract thing goes everywhere. And as much as I love who did my artwork for my book, because we were friends, it clouded how I did business. And therefore, it, I let a lot of like time slide by that didn't necessarily need to slide by. Um, and, but we had a contract. We had a contract with dates. And I was like, ah, it's okay. Oh, it's okay. Oh, it's okay. No, it wasn't okay. You know? And so therefore, maybe not your friends because that, that, that friend thing can, can shade you, can impact how you're viewing stuff or the vice versa. But also, but someone you have a good rapport with. Like I know Dominique because she joined Black Authors Collaborative and then she joined the New York Writers Group. And I know the per one of the people whose books she's done and I've seen how happy they are with her work. So therefore, every time someone asks me for an uh, editor, Dominique and Helen is another person who's been in all those groups. I, I'm automatically, there's Helen and there's Dominique. Go find them and find out what you can do. So there's all, you have to see what other people are saying about them. You have to watch their moves, see what they're putting out to see if it's even gelling, see who's worked with them and vet them and see if it's a good relationship. So not your friends, but someone in your network possibly, or be intentional because I'm being very intentional that everyone I'm using for my materials right now are black owned businesses because that's been important. When I brought, did my book launch, I did it at a black owned business. But so I'm intentionally going, who do I know who fits this criteria? Who can I give my dollars to? But you know, you have to figure out what you need. So we are- oh, Sorry, I would just say, um, if uh, that's something that's important to you on the agenting side, I'm going to send another link out. Uh, LitAgentsOfColor.com uh, is a, 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 a whoa. What is the word? <laughs> it's a compendium. <laughs> it's a compendium of uh, sites and contact info for Lit Agents of Color. Okay, we are quickly approaching time, so I wanted to ask everyone one final question, which is, what are three the three most important things you feel every author writer should know? before they pursue getting published? Uh, first of all, uh, know what kind of genre your story is going to be in. Uh, that's something that, uh, that a lot of people really kind of, you know, take for granted. They really need to know where it's, go where it's going to go, where it's going to be sold. Um, the second thing would be, um, what would you, you know, like, uh, do you have, do you have a team? Do you have a team on hand that is going to that is going to help you? Do you have an editor? Do you have beta readers? Uh, do you have um, do you have a cover designer? Um, if you are going the agent route, do you have one, do you have one of those? Um, and what kind of what kind of route do you want to go in? Do you want to do the self publishing or do you want to go traditional? Um, and the other one I would basically just say is be prepared to cover all the bases. Be prepared for paperback, ebook, and audio. Highly recommended that you go through all three because the more, the more people have a chance to read your book, the more different venues, the more opportunities you have for success. Uh, okay, I, I will, oh, oh. <laughs> never mind. Go ahead, Dominique, okay. go, go ahead. <laughs> um, I would say, uh, I actually have just kind of like a top two, know what you want your writing career to look like because sometimes people just want to have their work published so they're just publishing it for them basically. Other times people do go into it like okay I want to make this amount of money off of my writing and then like George said you know know your audience, your genre, what, what do you want to write in and whatever you choose make sure your craft is to the best it can be in that genre. So I would say why? Know your why. Why are you trying to be a writer? Then know your what, what are you trying to write? Like um, George, what genre, um, what, to who are you trying to write? And then where, where are you trying to go with writing? Are you just trying to do this as a hobby? Because, or are you trying to actually make this a career? If this is trying to be a career, you move in that 
that you move in that direction with that strategy. If you just want to make some extra money, another stream of income as a hobby, like a side side business, then you have a strategy to do that according to your to your why or where you're trying to go. Sam, did you have dark? Is it, oh, uh, <laughs> um, oh. Three things you have to know. I mean, it's true. I think you want to know who else is out there doing what you're doing, which is a function of, of, of what Tony and, and George are both talking about with knowing your genre, not only knowing where you fit, but knowing who else is doing what you do. Because I think knowing what the competition's doing uh, can really boost not only your awareness of how to sell yourself as a unique author and your work as, as unique books, um, but it can also um, sort of boost your confidence in knowing that other people are out there making work similar to yours, um, sell copies. Um, so, so yeah, read as much as possible and, and know uh, whose audience you would like to share. Thank you. And thank you to all the panelists. This has been great, a lovely discussion and more than what we can imagine. I'm actually going to turn it over to Dara. She's going to do her final three and closing remarks. So we didn't forget her, but thank you everyone for being on the panel today. Dara. So I want to say um, thank you, Eunice, for moderating, for being a source of structure for a crazy idea a crazy person had a couple of months ago or years ago. Um, and so therefore, also not only just thank you to you, but thank you to the New York Urban League and professionals for your support and ability to make this happen. Um, I will say thank you to our publishing as well, but I'm going to go back to Urban League for a second. Just so you know, many of you were kind enough to actually make a donation. Today's donations are actually going to support the New York Urban League Young Professionals and the Whitney M. Young Scholarship Fund. The Whitney M. Young Scholarship Fund provides scholarships that go into the hands not this is not something that's tax deductible we don't tell the government about it this is a very different unique scholarship where it goes into the hands of incoming college freshmen who are students of color from new york city so they may be going to any school across the country but they have um they have they are new york city residents at the time of receiving the scholarship so we, we help these children be, these young adults become support it, you know, there's books, there's all these other fees in school that they don't know about. And so we are honored to, to donate towards that contribution. It is an amazing um, fund. I actually used to run part of it. I did the mentoring program, which is also part of that scholarship that comes with it. So we want to say thank you all for your generosity to help make that happen. If you have not made a donation yet, you still can. Um, we can give you that information as well, or you and you can do it through um, PayPal at Tony Inc. Uh, pay, PayPal me at Tony Inc. Um, dot com, or is it just Tony Inc.? I don't know. Um, it's you, you have to use the email, I believe. It's yes. So, so it's, oh, oh, it, oh, PayPal me slash. Um, We're going to drop it in the yeah. chat. Yeah, I'll drop it in. <laughs> but so if you would like to still make a donation, please do. And otherwise, do go to Urban League and find out more about everything that they're doing, especially the young professionals. As a member of 10 years, 11 years going on, um, it has been an honor to support the community of New York City. So thank you all for that. Thank you to the panel who have participated and supported us as well. You guys, I mean, I know all of you, so I'm honored that you believed in this idea and vision to make it happen. They are amazing people. I don't vouch for just anybody. I may vouch for a lot of people, but I vouch for really good people. So please do speak to them. We will, if we haven't dropped it in the chat yet, we will. And then if you, since you're here on the Zoom, you also will have, get an email after the event itself with ways to contact the panel. So my three things, uh, um, before I even say that, thank you to my partner, Tony, um, who deals with me every day. We are like brother and sister. We only met during COVID-19, this whole sheltering in place, but we're working on big things. So thank you for helping make a vision a thing as well, because um, it was really a three-tier partnership to make this happen. That said, we are past time, but I do want to say my three things. Don't edit yourself while you're writing, because otherwise you'll never write the book. So to get the, right, to get the book writing, just write and people need it. So just because it may not be for me, just because it may not be for you needs or whomever, people still need your words. So don't doubt that, put the words out there. And then the last note was know your resources, know what you have the ability to do, know who's in your network, know what you, who you can tap on, and then budget your time, your money, your time, your researching ability, budget all of that to fill in the gaps. 
So what don't you have? I don't have the ability to send emails. So what do I have? Somebody on my team who sends the emails on my behalf. So figure out what you're missing in your queue of everything and then find out how to fill that. And that, those are my three nuggets. Write, but write, write, write. We need your words. We need your words. In a world that's trying to silence words, we need, we need your words even more important than before. So on that note, we really just want to say thank you all for joining us today. It has been a pleasure to create this panel. I see Tony drop the question of will we do a part two. So apparently he's convincing us that we will as long as we can get everyone back together. Is but that we- right, guys? Is that right? Oh, I just got to get their commitment right now on, on the on the chat. Follow recording. <laughs> Yo, I know tactics of selling. Are you going to really say no on a Zoom call in front of the whole world right now? <laughs> But again, I mean, we've had over 40 people this entire time. Um, We had much more um, registered, but of course, technical difficulties. So we thank you for rocking with us this entire time. We will definitely do this again, because as I said, we're creating something that people need. Eunice corrected me and said we are what people need. And therefore, we will make a commitment to continuing to support you guys in your writing ventures. We know there's questions we didn't get to, but we will. Um, You can reach us and we will do that and let you know answers as best we can. Thank you guys for coming. Oh, did, did you, I'm sorry, did you mention the scholarship? I'm sorry. Yes, I did. Okay, my, my bad, my bad. Money's going to scholarship. That's why you can <laughs> My bad, sorry. <laughs> <laughs> thank you, Mary. Okay, thank you, everyone.